So now that we've met how returns work, we can talk about some of the classic issues and, and propositions of finance. Let's start with the risk-free rate. Um, where we got to in thinking about risk-free rates was RF is 1 over E of M. Let's look at that a little more closely. Now, our prime model for, for M, the discount factor, is 1 over expected beta consumption growth to the minus gamma. And now you kind of have a yuck ahead of you. You're taking the expected value of something raised to a power. It's nonlinear. It's a 1 over. And it would be nice to do some approximations. Here's where continuous time comes to the rescue. And this will be one of your first big payoffs for having invested in continuous time. You'll see how we surmount all these nonlinearities by doing a continuous time approach. So as a reminder, how does continuous time work? Uh, last time, we thought about what our basic uh, p equals e of mx looks like in continuous time. 0 equals e of d lambda v. Let's apply that to the case of a risk-free rate. So our basic, uh, our basic condition was 0 equals e of d lambda v. I like it in proportional form. Use Ito's lemma, d of lambda times v is d lambda dv, and then the cross term. Don't forget those Ito's lemma cross terms. So that's expanded our basic first order condition for, for an asset with cumulative value process dv over v. A risk-free rate has a cumulative value process. I call it B because for bond, that's a tradition. Uh, it only has an RFDT term, so this Ito term is going to vanish, right? Because if that only has a DT term, that times that is going to be of higher order. So the only terms left now are the D lambda over lambda and the DV over V. Uh, therefore, RF, that term, becomes minus E of D lambda over lambda. You can see clearly how that equation is the continuous time counterpart of that equation, and that you get a minus rather than a 1 over, which is the simplification, kind of simplification that you get out of Ito's lemma and continuous time. Well, that's, that's a little bit of progress. Now, let's try to put the consumption back in. So uh, our, our continuous time discount factor is e to the minus delta consumption to the minus gamma. We use Ito's lemma again. So let's use Ito's lemma to express d lambda over lambda in terms of consumption properties. So what does Ito's lemma give us? We have the derivative with respect to time, the derivative with respect to consumption, and the second derivative with respect to consumption. Don't forget those Ito's lemma terms. That's a general result that will be useful for us. Now let's look at it a little more. What does this mean? Um, if consumption, for example, follows a diffusion process with a drift and a diffusion, that means that the discount factor has a drift term, which is the delta term. It's the drift term of the consumption that comes out of here. The diffusion term comes out of there, so there's the drift, and then the same sensitivity to the uh, consumption shocks. So now we know how to connect the discount factor to the properties of consumption, and that's, notice it's all linear. That's gotten us around this to the gamma part. OK, now we plug it all in, and we've got a, uh, a pretty answer. Um, RF is minus expected uh, discount factor growth. Discount factor growth is this term here. So what do we get? The expected value of that is the drift in consumption. So we just take expected values. The risk-free rate is delta, that's that term, plus gamma expected growth in consumption minus 1 half gamma gamma plus 1 times the variance of consumption growth. That's the continuous time version. Uh, now we can just read from that the discrete time approximation. We've been looking for an approximation to that thing. So in discrete time, the risk rate is the delta term, gamma times expected consumption growth, and uh, gamma gamma plus 1 times the variance of consumption growth. Now you've done a lot of work. Let's sit back and enjoy uh, the beauty of what, what we see. We have here a theory of where interest rates come from. What makes interest rates go up or down? Well, first, delta, impatience. If P, you live in an economy where people are more impatient, interest rates are going to be higher. Interest rates are about uh, uh, what, what does it take to get people to save some of their uh, income, not consume it all today, and consume some tomorrow. Well, if people are more impatient, you have to pay them a higher interest rate to consume tomorrow rather than today. Next term, intertemporal substitution. 
This says that interest rates are higher when consumption growth is higher. Now let's think about that. That seems kind of strange. Here's time. Think about consumption growing at CT to CT plus one. Why do you have it, if that's a high consumption growth, why are interest rates high? Well, high consumption growth means that consumption is low today. If you knew you were gonna be really rich tomorrow, why not go out and have a nice dinner tonight? Well, in order to keep you from consuming all of that stuff today and waiting till tomorrow, we have to pay you a high interest rate to get you to substitute consumption from today until tomorrow. Gamma here acts as the, the intertemporal substitution elasticity. It controls how much do I have to bribe you with a higher interest rate to get you to consume less today and have a big consumption growth from today till tomorrow. The third term is precautionary savings. If you live in an economy with a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty, what happens then? Well, if you live in an economy with a lot of uncertainty, people are nervous about the future and they try to save a lot today. If people are trying to save a lot today, that's going to drive down today's interest rates. Uh, we're gonna have a very low interest rate because everybody's already trying to save. Uh, here, the, the gamma is acting as a risk aversion coefficient. It's telling us how much people react to uncertainty about the future by trying to put it all in mattresses today. You can see gamma has the same coefficient as having two functions here. And we'll look later in the course at, at utility functions that, that separate those two, uh, those two functions and let people have different responses to consumption over time and aversion to risk. Now this is actually a very sensible theory. Let, let's think about what it says. This predicts that if there's a time when consumption growth is low, like a recession, uh, like the one we've just been through, then interest rates should be low as well. Interest rates should follow uh, expected consumption growth. You don't need any Federal Reserve. You don't need any surprises like that. This is just how an economy should behave and pretty much how the economy does behave. Variance too. If you go through a period of great uncertainty like the one we've just been through, that predicts that interest rates will be low as well. So this theory uh, it captures the main features of what we see in the data, even though it's very simple. So what have you seen? I hope this is exciting. You've seen the first example of our theory making a prediction about what an asset price should do. That prediction relates interest rates to macroeconomic events. Uh, and, and how people feel about those events, and comes out to something that's at least on a, a verbal level uh, plausibly true about, about how things work.